It says here, uh, Life Among the Texas Indians, the WPA Narratives, from uh, this book right here, as you can see. All right, so it says in this part right here, this book, it says, on August 2nd, 1937, there was a human skeleton discovered deposited in a crevice of limestone rock in Atoka County. This location being within the boundary of the hunting grounds in which the Comanche Indians were permitted to use as their hunting grounds for 90 days. At that time, permission was given a band of Creek Indians was hunting in different locations in Pittsburgh County without permission, which caused some trouble between the Choctaw and Creek Indians. In all probability, the Comanche Indians at their usual hunting season camped at this particular place. The human skull and skeleton shows that probably he was a Negro Indian type. He was probably a Negro Indian type and indicated that he was shot with a bow and arrow. The arrowhead being the type that Comanches used. The point of the arrowhead entering the body extends into the backbone. And the point of the arrowhead still remains in the backbone of the skeleton. Beads and other ornaments found with the skeleton show the type that a Creek Negro Indian wore in those days. Again, a Negro Creek Indian, the type of clothes and the beads and the ornaments. All right. More correlation. Okay. This is from the Historical Collections of Georgia, containing the most interesting facts, it says here. The Historical Collections of Georgia. And this is Tustenugi Imatla. I hope I'm saying that right. A Creek warrior. And this is what he looks like. You see, do you remember who you are? You see this. So when we're talking about Indians, remember... We're talking about the couple colored tribes of America. And uh, let me just read the story here. It says here that he was a full-blooded Creek and was born on the Tallapoosa River about the year 1793. He was familiarly known by the name of Jim Boy, who was properly entitled to that which we have placed at the head of this article. Tustenuge, meaning warrior, and Emathla, Emathla, which signifies next to the warrior. When the war broke out in 1811 between the Creeks and Americans, he was too young to wield the tomahawk, but was permitted to follow the warriors. When the Creeks became divided into two parties, one of whom was friendly to the Americans and the other hostile and unwilling to emigrate, Tustenugi, a mafla, attacked, attached himself to the former party. In the Florida War, he rendered important services. His family, consistent of a wife, and nine children were among the unfortunate persons who were on board the steamboat Monument when that vessel sunk and 236 of the creeks, including four of the children of Tustenugi and Mafla, were drowned. All right, so unfortunate, right? What happened? We're talking about uh, 236 creeks. Now, was this an accident or was this something somebody, you know, made happen? But we can never forget the ancestors, right? And these aren't Africans. He was not an African. Again, was a full-blooded Creek. What does full-blooded mean? It means both his parents are Creeks. Not just his mom, not just his dad. Both of them are Creeks. He's full-blooded Creek. This is what he looked like. All right? 
So the creeks, most of them you can trace back if you really go into the research over to Mexico, you know, along with the uh, Muscogean, uh, Muscogee speaking tribes of the South Confederate, the creeks, you know, you can trace them back to Michoacan, I believe, in Mexico. I'm in the book here. Uh, from the Smithsonian Institution Bureau of American Ethnology, Bulletin 73. It says, The Early History of the Creek Indians and Their Neighbors by John R. Swanson. All right. And it says here on page 43, it says, The Spaniards have visited several regions of that vast country. And they're like, I believe, in the area of South Carolina, North Carolina, where they first arrived in the 1500s. You caught my, my past videos. They're called Arambi, Guaycaya, Cuajate, Tansaca, and Pajor. Do you know the name? Do you ever heard of these names, these tribes? The color of the inhabitants is what? Dark brown. The color of the inhabitants is dark brown. Dark brown. None of them have any system of writing, but they preserve tr traditions of great antiquity in rhymes and chants. In rhymes and chants, so we got inhabitants who are dark brown, who be rhyming and chanting, rhyming, right? Rhyming, freestyling, chanting, rhymes, dark brown, put it together. Dancing and physical exercises are held in honor, and they are passionately fond of ball games. They're very fond of ball games. Hmm, who does this sound like? Let's go again. Inhabitants are dark brown, right? They pass their time in rhymes and chants, and they're very fond of ball games, in which they exhibit the greatest skill. They're very good at it, too. All right, they're very good at it. They're fond of ball games, and they're very good at it. They're dark brown. Their complexion is dark brown, and they be rhyming. Who are they talking about? So called Negro? Says here, the Black Americans suing to reclaim their Native American identity all right so let's get into this article so we got to dodge the hijack all the time you know uh, as it says here their ancestors were black slaves owned by native america so we already know that's completely false because we know right just like webster's dictionary tells us that the original americans right were the copper colored tribes of america and we're going to be talking about creeks right so we just got this in this is what a creek looks like this is a real Creek warrior to Stenugi Imafla. All right, so you can see, all right, this is what a creek looks like. They weren't slaves, all right? The creeks were so called Negro and they were coming from Mexico, as we've said, seen in the last uh, video parts, all right, and all the books we've read. All right, so let's get on with the article. It says here Johnny May Austin and her grandson Demario Solomon Simons can tell you everything about their ancestry. They can go back as far as 1810, the year Solomon Simon's great, 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 great grandfather, Cal Tom, was born. With undeniable pride, they recount the man's feats, feats of bravery during the Civil War and his leadership with Oklahoma's Creek population. In fact, they are so determined to let the world know exactly who Cal Tom was that they're suing the Creek Nation to make sure his descendants aren't forgotten. Solomon Simons and his grandmother are black, but they argue they're also Creek and they're fighting to reclaim their identity. They're fighting to reclaim their identity. And that's what all of you are basically doing right now as well. In 1979, a new tribal constitution made it more difficult to prove Creek ancestry. Black Creeks in particular found it almost impossible to claim the identity of their ancestors and as a result, thousands lost their Creek citizenship. In August 2018, Solomon Simons, the lead attorney representing six named plaintiffs, including his grandmother, filed a lawsuit against the Muscogee Creek Nation and the Interior Department to fully restore the citizenship of Black Creek. Stash the hijack with Black. As a result, a minority group is suing another minority group for inclusion in the indigenous minority group. And to settle this peculiar case, one has to go back nearly 200 years. All right. All right so we see here the beautiful great mother, Johnny May Austin, says whose fought, grandfather was a Creek to the bone, is a plaintiff in the Creek Freedman suit. 
a creek to the bone, just like Tustenugi, a mafla, a creek to the bone, was a full bloody creek. All right, full bloody creek. No Africans, there's no slave, no nothing like that. Dodge the hijack. All right, so it says Austin 86 was born in Haskell, Oklahoma. Her grandfather, Jake Simons, was Creek to the bone, she says. Simon spoke fluent Creek, and Austin chuckles at the memory of him using Creek curse words. When I interviewed her in her North Tulsa home, she sang me one of the songs her grandfather taught her also in Creek. Jake Simons was Kautam's grandson. He, like other black slaves owned by Native American, dodged the hijack, made his way west on the Trail of Tears. The forced relocation of Native American peoples from Florida to Oklahoma. Some of Kautam's descendants dispute he was ever a slave. Mm, I told you, some of Kautam's descendants dispute he was ever a slave. Again, let's go back. To Stenugi Emafla, a Creek warrior, was a full-blooded Creek, full-blooded, both parents, they aren't slaves, he was a full-blooded Creek, just like Johnny May Austin's ancestor, all right? Some documents say he was initially a Creek slave, either way, he arrived in Oklahoma in the early 1830s and soon became a pillar of the Black Creek community and a man of considerable economic and political stature. Accounts from Cowtown's Cow Tom's grandchildren describe him as a jet black man of medium build, whose success was measured by his seemingly unlimited supply of cattle. A cultural broker helped by his English skills and familiarity with white American culture, Cow Tom eventually served as the principal chief of the Canadian town, a freed black township within the Creek Nation freed and also represented the Creek Nation before the Interior Department. Kautam's success was not particularly unique among hard-working Black Creeks in eastern Oklahoma. On 18 November 1910, the Topeka Plain Dealer reported that a large percentage of the Negro population on the eastern side of the state had rich allotments from their Indian citizenship. So you hear this, right? Rich allotments from their Indian citizenship. How did these slaves get land? Well, now you know they were Indians. According to the same article, many of them started out as slaves of the Creeks, but gained freedom through the Emancipation Proclamation. The U.S. government compelled Native Americans to sign treaties allowing their former Negro slaves to share in their landed inheritance, meaning black former slaves were given plots of land in the Creek community. That was their land originally. And again, her, um, you know, their family, his descendants, they dispute he was ever a slave. So listen to the family. Don't listen to what these documents are telling you because that's a, high, a white man version of what they call you. They call you African. Remember, remember in the last video, they called you African so they can enslave you. If they called you Indian, you'd be free. All right. Continuing says, in Oklahoma in the late 1970s, Austin routinely received mail from the Creek Nation. The mail typically included news ballots for voting on tribal matters and checks for shares of the revenue from land and cattle dealing. That mail was a connection to an identity Austin always thought was true. It's just who I was, she says, until the mail suddenly stopped in 1979. This was the result of a 1976 federal lawsuit during the which the Creeks had managed to shake off some of the paternalistic reach of the U.S. government. Creeks then voted to re reconstitute citizenship parameters, kicking out many black people who had enjoyed citizenship since 1866. According to Daniel Littlefield of the Sequoia Nation Research Center, there's a strong element of we are a tribe, Indians, to that decision. So I think it was probably just out and out racism that motivated those people to remove black people from inclusion in the nation. Citizenship parameters were now limited to those who could find ancestors registered on the 1906 DOS roll, a specific federal census that defined Native Americans according to the vague principle of blood quantum. Without the intricate genealogical testing that is readily accessible now, the DOS roll based on interviews and eyeballing of people's ancestry yielded less than precise results. Austin recalls a family story about her grandparents, one who looked very dark, was assumed not to have Creek ancestry, and another, whose skin tone was very light, was assumed to be a Creek, but both were equally Creek. All right, so you see that same family. All right, one was dark, 
he was again considered a slave african not indigenous his family who's a little lighter yeah he was indian now we've been reading the article right making indians white because now we know that these were uh not uh, based on color but based on status white men status black status social status all right let's get this to our heads they were playing games when they were doing all these classifications all right today if you want a creek citizenship you would have to find a direct lineage to a person on that role nathan wilson of the creek citizenship office says austin can't trace her direct lineage to the creek by blood list of that role which the citizenship office uses for validating citizenship but her family can be found on the Creek Freedmen list on the on, of the Dawes role. Coincidentally, their own and their ancestors' blackness nullified their Creek by blood status. You're hearing this, right? Instead, their case rests on an 1866 treaty between the U.S. government and the Creek Nation, which makes plain the nation's thoughts on citizenship. There are among the Creeks many persons of African descent. Dodge the hijack. The treaty notes so that's the treaty from 1866 when they're already pushing the hijack, right? Of be, you making you an African a slave and all that. And list Cow Tom as an official delegate of the Creeks. And this is Sharon Lancey Scott, Secretary of the Creek Freedman Band in Oklahoma City. The treaty states that persons lawfully residing in said Creek country, or even those who temporarily left as well as their descendants, may return within one year from the rat ratification of this treaty as can their descendants and such others of the same race as may be permitted by the laws of the said nation to settle within the limits of the jurisdiction of the Creek nation as citizens. All descendants, the treaty adds, shall have and enjoy all the rights and privileges of native citizens, and the laws of the said nation shall be equally binding upon and give equal protection to all such persons and all others of whatsoever race or color who may be adopted as citizens or members of said tribe. Solomon Simon says the Creek Nation is not a race, it's a political entity, and they've got obligations. His main claim is that that treaty is still good law and hasn't been abrogated. He anticipated the Creek Nation Nation's arguments. They're going to say they have a right to determine who are citizens. Technically, he agreed. I believe that it is your right to determine citizenship like any other sovereign nation, but just like any other sovereign nation, not a race, you, the Creeks, signed a treaty. This is in Solomon Simon's first legal battle with the Creek Nation. In the early 2000s, he tried two cases somewhat similar to the one he filed this summer, but back then he did so within the Creek Nation's judicial system, with two other descendants of Black Creeks, Ron Graham and Fred Johnson, as his clients. After several bouts in the Creek Nation judicial system, Solomon Simon's lost the case. The setback has to stop him. As he pushes forward with his case, he follows in the footsteps of two earlier activists, Rhonda Grayson and Sharon Lancey, both are relatively unassuming women and trailblazing activists for citizenship rights of Black Creeks. Grayson, a financial manager of delivery and repair service, grew up partly on the country roads of Wewoka, Oklahoma, where her great-grandmother, America Kohi, lived. Kohi only spoke the Creek language and she only attended the Indian church. Grayson told me as she stared at the picture, rubbing her hands along the glossy laminated frame, she was 90 when we were kicked out of the nation. As a young person, Grayson didn't know about her family's expulsion from the nation. It was only when she talked with her grandmother that she decided to start doing my own research in the early 2000s by just going to the Oklahoma History Center. She wondered, why my mother, my aunts, no one was enrolled in the tribe until someone at the History Center told me that my family were on Creek Freedman Rolls. Lindsay, a retired hospital manager, recalled her mother telling her of their ancestor Legus Chateau Perryman, a black man who served as a principal chief of the Creek Nation from 1887 to 1895. And this is him right here. As you can see, right? She didn't realize she was a Black Creek member until 1979 because the distinction did not have much meaning before then. For Lancy and her mother, she was Creek first. Our official Creek mail stopped coming. 
my mother called the Creek Nation, and they told her and my grandmother that they were freedmen and weren't entitled to any more checks, Lancy said. Lancy showed me a 1980 letter from the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Indian Affairs, which only affirmed what the nation told her mother. Despite numerous denied citizenship applications, Lancy holds fast to something her mother told her. Don't forget your heritage. All right, I'm going to stop right here, and I want everybody to pay attention to. All right, this is what Lancy's mom told her, right? Uh, a Creek Indian, an American She knew who she was, and she made sure her daughter, right? She told her, don't forget your heritage, and don't let anyone tell you anything different, all right? So remember, Drop Nation, Mashahab, King Drop, if they can't tell you who you are, how can they tell you who you're not, all right? She and Grayson joined forces with other Creek descendants in 2012 to file for recognition, host national conferences, and create a documentary currently in development on the history of Creek freedmen. Now, as named plaintiffs in Solomon Simon's lawsuit, their motivation is clear. They want visibility. We are left out of Oklahoma history, Grayson says. It is a missing piece of history, and it's a valuable piece of history. Oklahoma history wouldn't be, can't be, history without the Creek freedmen. According to Alina Roberts of the University of Pittsburgh, Native American nations have always had this fear, and a valid fear, that when they accept black people as part of their tribe, they are seen as not Indian first. So is this a valid fear? I mean, if they're not the original Indians, why should they fear that? All right. Robert explains that Indianness is self-imposed as well as imposed from the outside. These nations have their own sense of who they are based on their culture and traditions they have retained, but also by the way they are legally recognized either by the state or federal government. This legal recognition, which often meant that unfair takeover of settled land, represents an imposition from outsiders, white outsiders, as to how much culture they're retaining. In fact, in the minutes of a 1977 Quarterly Creek National Council meeting, the then Principal Chief Claude Cox expresses concern with the former 1866 Treaty and Associated Constitution of 1867. When you go back to the old Constitution, you are licked before you start because it doesn't talk about Indians. It talks about citizens, he told the council, referring explicitly to black districts within the Creek community. He described his fear of being outnumbered. You hear that? <laughs> If we want to keep the Indian in control, we've got to take a good look at this thing and get us cons get us a constitution that will keep the Creek Indian in control, he says. But this isn't just about identity. As identity parameter parameters could dictate sharing in financial gains, Robert says the actual disenfranchisement of black people by the Creeks and the Cherokee started in the late 20th century coincided with a time when a lot of the tribes had begun to build their econo economies and make a lot of money. She points out this was precisely the time when many of the nations started to see an influx of enrollment applications. The current Creek principal, Chief Jamie Floyd, declined to comment, and his press offices referred me to the nation's citizenship office led by Nathan Wilson, so he don't want to comment, because he knows what's up, don't want to comment. We're an independent agency constitutionally, and we're listed in the Constitution as independent, Wilson told me. But the vagueness of the nation's response shouldn't be read as a dismissal of the importance of the citizenship issue. In fact, the Creek Nation is lawyering up. Venable LLP, a top Washington, D.C. law firm, contacted Solomon S Simons in August on behalf of the Creek Nation. Both the Creek Nation and the Interior Department have filed motions to dismiss on October, uh, 5th October and the court will respond on 2nd November. Creek leaders know that this won't be an easy fight. The Cherokee Nation and Seminole Nation lost in 2017 on similar grounds. For Solomon Simons, the case is clear-cut. His message to the Creek Nation is succinct. You have to follow the law like everybody else. Again, you have to follow the law like everybody else. And again, this was the article the black Americans soon to reclaim their Native American identity. Why do you have to fight so much 
to prove who you are. Why? When we look, yeah, so I'm like you guys. I celebrate American history, uh, which is our history, every month out the year. And I hope that for parents and kids that go home, now we have the internet. Now we have tools at our hand. And no, you aren't being taught black American history in schools, but now we can still go out and find that history. It's not like when we grew up and maybe it was buried someplace in the encyclopedia. All you gotta do is go type in some words and you can get it right now and, and understand where you've come from and how special you are. Can I just end with this one thing? These four brothers sitting here, we didn't all come from Africa. And there was a united, there was, there was a country before 1492 and our history goes way beyond 1492. So you can't start us at 1492. We were always here. We were always here. We were always here. We were always here.